All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Saving Life on Earth speaker series webinar. We know that there's a lot going on right now with fires and racial injustice in the pandemic. So we appreciate your taking the time to be with us tonight. And I just want to say thank you to Steve, who wrote in the questions that there are no plants pictured on our introduction slide. And you're right, and we will fix that. So thanks for calling us out on that, because tonight we're going to talk about endangered plants. And I'm really excited for you to meet two of our staff who work on plants. Um, a couple of technical notes. We've disabled chat because it's very distracting. We heard that from you guys. We're going to save 20 minutes at the end to take your questions and answers. If you have burning questions that we don't get to tonight, we'll be on Slack tomorrow at noon Pacific for an hour to keep up the conversation. If you're not on our Slack channel, right after this webinar, you will get an email that has a link to how to join Slack. It also has an action alert that you can take to help save endangered plants. And there'll be a link to the video of this webinar. Um, so that won't get posted until tomorrow, but after tomorrow, the video for the webinar will be on YouTube. So you can watch it and you can find it at savelifeonearth.org. Oh, and I always forget to say, I'm Tierra Curry. I'm a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. And I'm gonna pass it over to our awesome speakers to introduce themselves. Eileen, you're on mute. Got it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Eileen Anderson, and I'm a senior scientist with the Center for Biological Diversity. And uh, while I do a lot of different things these days, I actually my uh, education and my passion is uh, for uh, plants, um, rare plants, common plants, any kind of plants, really, uh, I'm fascinated by because the green world is such a unique and incredible uh, place to study and appreciate and just basically hang out with. So I'm really excited to be here today uh, to talk to you about plants and thanks so much for joining. Aloha mai kako. My name is Max Phillips and I'm the Hawaii director for the center. Um, I'm also the one staff attorney here in Hawaii. I am like Eileen plant crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you could tell from the way my house looks and my lei po'o, but I um, mean, actually, even my aloha print has a endangered tree on it. But um, there's just not enough I can get of our of our native plants here in Hawaii. We, it's just my privilege and my honor to be able to work with the center to help to protect these these special and unique organisms. Hey, Max, do you want to tell people about this slide? Sure. So when we were coming up with talking about this uh, webinar, this image came to mind, which during the pandemic I saw, and it's in the um, Barcelona Opera House, where these amazing musicians performed to an audience of almost 2,000 plants. And so um, I just thought, what an incredible opportunity. Um, we're going to share the link for the live performance, which is unbelievable. And, um, and it's actually also why I brought a bunch of my plants here, so I didn't feel so lonely. I'm used to having, um, I like to approach my presentations just like I approach the way I litigate, which is stand-up comedy. And so I don't know if my jokes are funny unless someone's laughing. And so I wonder if the maybe the the musicians felt the same way about their work and it helped to have the plants there. So anyways, I thought it would be a fun thing to share and get us started. See, I told you they were awesome. I can't wait to hear more about what they're doing. So plants, um, at least 600 plant species have been lost to extinction since 1900. And we only know the status of 11% of all the plants on the planet, but having only looked at 11% of them, we know that 16,000 plants are at risk of extinction. In the United States and Canada, 53 plants have already been lost to extinction, but it's not too late to save the rest of them. And so I want to show you some pictures of some beautiful plants that the center has been working to save. This is the Lasix lupin. It lives in alpine habitat. Oh, am I not sharing? I'm screen sharing. Okay, I am. Sorry about that. I'm really bad at tech, you guys. 
Um, the lasix lupin lives in alpine habitat in California, and it's threatened by climate change. It's this beautiful flower. We sought Endangered Species Act protection for it in 2016, and it's still on the waiting list. This is the silvery phacelia. It grows on coastal habitat in southern Oregon and northern California. It's threatened by off-road vehicle use and invasive plant species, and we petitioned for Endangered Species Act protection for it back in 2014, and it's still waiting. This is Arizona Eringo. This flower is amazing. It's five feet tall and it has to have its feet wet. So it grows in Arizona. It used to grow in New Mexico, but it's extirpated there and it's threatened by cattle grazing and water withdrawals. There's only two surviving populations of this plant in the United States. And we've been working for a few years to get protection for it. And I'll introduce you to one more. This is beautiful Barbara's Buttons. Um, it lives in streamside habitat in Appalachia in Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. They just discovered that they split this plant into two and the populations that were in North Carolina are a different species, but they've already gone extinct. And but this one, beautiful Barber's Buttons, we petitioned for back in 2010. So the action alert you'll get tonight, you can write Fish and Wildlife Service and ask them to protect these plants and the other 72 plants that are on the waiting list. So now Max and Eileen are going to tell you more about their work and all the plants the center is advocating for. Um, first, over to Eileen. Eileen, how did you get interested in plants? Um, I think I really got bitten by the green bug in college. But prior to that, of course, you know, as a kid, I, I tried to grow a garden and, and um, you know, truth be known, I'm actually not a very good gardener at all, but I'm still really, really enchanted by plants. So I do my best. Um, and uh, so in college, it just sort of all came together, you know, my leaf collection that I did probably when I was in first or second grade, you know, piqued my interest in all the beautiful shapes of flowers and or of leaves. Um, but then I realized that, um, you know, we share the same genetic material as all plants do. And in a way that just sort of blew me away because we often think of plants as being um, yeah, they're living, but, you know, they live in a different way, and, and yet we share an incredible amount of genetic material with them. And so I started having a greater respect from them, looking at basically just from the genetics point of view. But then in realizing, you know, how much they do for us, that they, <laughs> they really don't need us on the planet, but we definitely need them on the planet. Um, and I'm just, I just then just totally started recognizing how, how we are dependent on them. Uh, and to a certain extent, they're dependent on us as well. But it's this whole symbiotic relationship between us and how we really, um, you know, don't appreciate all, what all the plants do for us um, on a daily basis, for sure, even though they provide our food, uh, provide shelter, the, clothes that we wear, the, all those things um, basically come, most all of them come from plants, or at least did historically. So that's what really got me to bow down at the plant altar and really appreciate these guys for all the benefits and making life so enjoyable, you know, uh, on top of the fact that they're beautiful to look at a lot of times. Yeah, plants are super beautiful. I, I hadn't thought about them in that way before. So thanks for sharing that with us. Max, Hawaii has so many incredible species of plants and many of them are culturally significant there. Can you talk to us about the cultural significance of plants in Hawaii? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, we're unfortunately known as the endangered species capital of the world and Hawaii has um, majority of our endangered plants for the continent too. And so it's really a huge um, Kuleana, as we call it, or a responsibility for um, protecting these species to make sure that they're around for generations to come. And that goes beyond, it's kind of what Eileen was saying. Um, it goes back to decolonizing our minds about um, a separateness between us and nature, right? That's a very colonial standpoint. And for Native Hawaiians, actually all living things are seen as, as family, as you know, and actually humans are the youngest out of all of them. And so we have a familial connection to our plant species, to our animal species, and we have therefore a responsibility like you would with a family member. And you see that throughout our culture here. Um, one is 
beautiful lay making like this lay, um, the use of our lays in hula, uh, the mele, the songs or the, or the chants that we speak to the origins of our different plant species, all the way down to our medicines, our la la pa'au, so our uses of our native plants for um, traditional medicines that continue on today. Ooh, and here's one of our one of our beautiful native species. This is a endangered species. Actually, we just won a lawsuit um, this year to establish critical habitat for this really special um, native plant. Something that's really interesting about it too is that it is again, like I said, used in traditional medicines. So um, in the past, this plant was used for all sorts of medicinal uses. Um, from the treatment of adults and different things for their throats, um, illnesses from, um, I don't know, um, stomach aches, things like that. So um, nowadays these plants are used just for teas, but again, it shows the importance and the, the connection between all of our living things here. Absolutely, that's awesome. Um, Eileen, talk to us about the ecological significance of plants. Why are plants important to the planet? Well, they're important because they are, they provide so many ecosystem services, one. Um, I sort of don't like that word ecosystem services, but they do provide us with, you know, so many things that we don't um, necessarily immediately associate with them. Yeah, we think of food, you know, obviously we eat our vegetables and fruits and that sort of thing. But they also do a lot of other things like help to create weather, help to stabilize soils, uh, allow for water infiltration, clean water. I mean, they're just, um, they're so helpful to us. Uh, it's incredible to me sometimes and how we take for granted these really important, um, really important things that they do for, for us humans. Um, and I think that we're gonna see this, you know, I hope that we will value this more and more as we see um, our climate shifting and, um, and be able to appreciate them more and also to facilitate them in doing what they need to do to survive because this is going to be you know, an upcoming time when you know, we're all going to be in this together. And um, so it's, it's just amazing to me the different things that they, they provide us. And I have a little chart that I just showed some of these ecosystem services to show the variety of different things they do in the different habitat types that they occur in or the different landscapes. So um, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's inspiring and just makes me very appreciative. So we can't live without plants, but plants are in really big trouble. Max, tell us about some of the threats to plants in Hawaii. Well, I mean, we can't talk about threats to plants right now without um, sending, we have smoke actually coming across um, the Pacific Ocean from the wildfires happening on our west coast on the continent. And so my heart just goes out to all of the families that are displaced, of course, or the lives that are lost, but also our plant species and our animal species, who even though, you know, a lot of our west coast has um, plants that have been evolved with the fire history, um, nothing has ever been seen like this. And so um, anyways, my heart just goes out to, to the car, our sisters on the continent. Um, here in Hawaii, we, uh, you know, as I said, we're the endangered species capital of the world, and we share a lot of threats that most island chains do, right? And that would be um, the introduction, introduction of invasive species, of deforestation, um, you know, non-controlled um, development. Um, and so, uh, without having adequate controls for these different invasive animals and diseases, weeds, um, and um, having adequate habitat protections, we've lost quite a number of our species. It's, you know, I think with our plant taxa, it's something like 100, over 120 species have gone extinct in Hawaii already. So um, these images right here, this is the mamane tree. Uh, the beautiful little yellow bird on the top there is the palila. This is a really important um, bird and tree for my island, Hawaii Island, where I was uh, raised. Uh, these trees grow up on the slopes of Mauna Kea and 
ancient stories talk about Mauna Kea being so covered in these beautiful yellow blossoms that it looked like the entire Mauna, the entire mountain was wearing a lei. And so unfortunately, this isn't what we see these days. And as a direct result of ungulates of cows, goats, and sheep, uh, the mamane tree was in threat of being eradicated. And because of that, the palila, which is a critically endangered bird, was in threat of being extinct for forever because our palila friends live exclusively off of the seed pods um, and the flowers and the leaves sometimes of the mamane. So it shows that these threats that we may not think towards our plant species can go all the way up and down our food chains, all the way throughout our entire ecosystems and impact everything. So um, there's a really famous line of court cases to ensure the protection of the mamane and the palila, um, which has really laid some foundational environmental law, which as an environmental attorney, I get really nerdy about, so I won't bore everybody. But uh, I think it's always important to talk about how those line of cases then has led to better ungulate management. So placing fences up and keeping the pigs, keeping the goats, keeping the cows out of areas that are highly sensitive with our, with our rare native um, endangered and threatened species. And so I like, and plus just look how beautiful it is. I mean, it's just such a beautiful tree, such a beautiful bird. If we were to lose either one of these species, it goes, I mean, I can't even, I can't even fathom it. It seems like living in Hawaii, it would be impossible to have plant blindness because there's so many awesome plants there. But one of the attendees, Steve, at the beginning was like, this is an example of plant blindness. So Eileen, what exactly is plant blindness? Well, plant blindness is um, essentially, it was, uh, here, here's a classic example of it. You know, what do people see when they look at this picture? And it was an idea that was actually described back in 1998 by two American botanists. And they define it as the inability to see or notice the plants in one's own environment, which leads to the inability to recognize the importance of plants in the biosphere and in human affairs. And it also uh, com compromise, uh, comprises an inability to appreciate the aesthetic and unique biological features of plants and the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals, leading to the erroneous conclusion that they are unworthy of human consideration. And it's, it's definitely a factor in ongoing declines in university botany programs, in herbaria, which are places that actually uh, catalog um, plants and other plant science facilities. And I think that this is, you know, really a classic issue that I am very concerned about. When I was in college, I actually couldn't get a degree in botany, which was what I was really looking to do. Uh, I had to settle for biological sciences because, um, and I studied plants, but it wasn't uh, totally focused on um, plants. People just don't seem to make a connection with them as perhaps they have in the past. Um, and a lot of times I know when I um, am out in the field with uh, people, they see a green wall, um, but they can't really distinguish, you know, the different, uh, that there are different plants out there that make up the green wall, much less what that, what those plants are. And so it's sort of a failure of our educational system uh, to be able to inspire people to see the beauty and the uniqueness of these plants, even the common ones. Um, you know, the, and then this, of course, um, uh, leads to not appreciating them, not having financial support for botanists. It's very rare to find a group of, of you know, botanists. Uh, they're few and far between these days, people that are really experts in their field. And uh, it's troubling to me to see um, sort of the lack of concern that people have for the green world out there because of the sustenance that they that it provides not only us but all of the other creatures on the planet as well um, so yeah so you know it's just a world view and people uh, have the opportunity to learn about them and I think when well I certainly know from my experience the more I learned about them the more enchanted I was in um, knowing plants and I consider them my friends and you know some plants when I walk out 
in the field and I haven't seen him for a while, it's like, oh, it's an old, I'm meeting an old friend again. And I, it gives me great pleasure to do that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so Max, so many plants in Hawaii are just on the brink of extinction. Why does it matter if an individual plant goes extinct? Mm, I mean, other than just the intrinsic inherent value of all life on earth, right? Um, as Eileen was talking about that, there's no one species that's better or more worthy than another. So with that, that's the framework obviously that I'm working with. Um, but beyond that, I think it's really important to recognize that each species contributes to the sustainability of each ecosystem. And especially here in Hawaii where our forests are what filter all of our water through our, you know, the top of our mountains all the way down, you know, um, it, it's, it, there's no way of knowing the true impact of losing one rare species, whether it be through what they do for water retention in that instance or recycling carbon dioxide or erosion control or, um, you know, being a place, a, a source of food for the bigger critters that depend on it or the smaller critters that may make their homes underneath it. There's just so much that we don't know about our plant species. Even, you know, these incredible botanists that put their whole life to it continually say that it's a life of learning, right? Because we just continue to um, find out more and more the more that we look. And, you know, ex extinction of one species, I think, would have, it has a broader effect too on all of humanity, more so than many people, I think, may think. One of these super rare plants goes extinct that's so not only a piece of our biodiversity that the whole world loses but here in Hawaii that's a family member you know here in Hawaii that's a word that is no longer used in Hawaiian so it's um you know it's a part of our language that goes extinct it's a part of our medicines that go extinct and it's a story that we can no longer tell our mo'opuna or our grandchildren downer. Ooh, this, this will make us, this goes from this, we went from down to up. We're about to, <laughs> we're about to make the vibe a lot better in here because when we talk about our endangered plants here in Hawaii, I just can't give enough aloha to the plant extinction prevention program. We call it PEP to put some PEP in our step. You know, Hawaii has, uh, you know, nearly 450 listed endangered species and PEP takes care of 237. Um, and these are all species that have less than 50 plants left in the wild. And so, I mean, these are just the real heroes for um, plant nerds like me. And I, I just we talk about bowing down to the, the folks that are really making the magic happen and keeping these plants from going extinct. So Max, do you get to go out in the field with them and work on plants sometimes? You know, I, um, I have been with some different pet members out in the field. I've had the privilege of working with some of our most incredible botanists here in Hawaii. Um, actually, Loyal Merhoff, who used to be with the center, he before was with the center, was with Fish and Wildlife. And it was through him that PEP really got the funding that it needed to, um, to be able to do the work that it did. It does. Um, unfortunately, under this administration, Fish and Wildlife has cut funding adequately. And so it's, um, it's scary times for the pet program. But yeah, I get to. It's so fun. It's the best to get away from my computer. Although I love this. I love all of you. Don't get me wrong. But um, nothing better than seeing some of these amazing, rare, beautiful species where they come from. It's, um, it gives you chicken skin. It fills your heart with so much hope. You know, and that's, I think, the best thing about PEP is it, um, it gives, it would be easy to say, okay, this one species that has um, only a two or three known um, wild, you know, it, it's only, there's only two or three of them left in the wild. It's going to go extinct. There's nothing we can do about it. And that's just not true. And this program has shown that. And the dedication of these botanists have shown that. The dedication of the attorneys who have fought to get these species on the endangered list have shown that the scientists who put their blood, sweat, and tears into getting all of the information that they can to make the case that these species need to be protected federally. I mean, it's not a lost cause. That's, uh, I guess, the biggest thing about, about the PET program that I take away is that we can do it.
We can do it. It is not a lost cause. Extinction is a political choice and we can make a different choice. And all the people on this webinar about endangered plants are making that choice to end extinction. So you were talking about rare plants. There are 435,000 described species of plants on planet Earth. 37% of them are considered to be exceedingly rare. Eileen, what does that mean? What makes a rare plant rare? And are rare plants even important? And do they have any protection? Certainly they're important. And I think that uh, rarity involves a number of different factors. Um, some plants are just rare on the landscape. Um, a lot of the work that I've done is, um, has been in Southern California. Uh, and yes, some of you may mock me, but there actually are open spaces and rare plants left in Southern California. It's not just all concrete. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I actually love living in Southern California is we have a lot of rare plants, although not as many as Max has. I got to give you that. <laughs> but they're still wonderful and there's still a lot of them. And a lot of times where plants uh, where I operate, um, not just in uh, Southern California, but um, are, they're associated very directly with unique soils. And so we have different kinds of soils out there that common plants find um, uninhabitable. They have some sort of strange constituent, whether that be calcium carbonate or um, you know, different soil components that make it really hard for plants to grow on them. And yet there's over, you know, evolutionary time, plant, some plants have adapted to that. And in that way, they have speciated into these unique rare plants. So they're found only in very localized areas where the soils are right. And um, so, you know, as when I was doing botany full time, uh, one of the wonderful things to have was a soils map because then you could really key in on places where you could go to look for rare plants. And uh, so I have a whole collection of soils maps actually, even though um, I now do a lot of different things, but I treasure those because they are a really useful tool to have. Um, and then the other way plants can get rare and um, is through uh, people liking to live in the same place that the plants live. And so in Southern California, many of our rare plants are, um, weren't uh, naturally rare, but have become rare because uh, their habitats have been uh, developed over. And uh, so a lot of our coastal strand plants are, um, you know, really living in that very fine line between <laughs> the surf line and the rack line and development. And some of those I think are the certainly, um, you know, we're really having to think about how we're going to um, facilitate them moving when, as uh, sea level uh, rises. Um, so there's some good, you know, as a scientist, some good challenges there in uh, trying to decide how we can best facilitate them. Um, rare plants can be tricky, but they can also be incredibly robust. And so, you know, great hope that um, we're going to be able to figure some of these things out. Uh, in time. So, but you can imagine if you have a rare plant that's already rare on the landscape and development, then you get into a real conundrum about, okay, how do you save these rare plants are oftentimes associated with rare habitats. Uh, and that can be very, very challenging to have the appropriate conservation put in place. We list rare, we list rare plants or try to get them listed, um, do listing petitions and then follow up in recent times with lawsuits because um, it's not, you know, it's, there's a lot of forces out there that don't want to protect the rare plants. But under the Federal Endangered Species Act anyways, uh, rare plants are treated actually as second class citizens. And there's a lot of um, loopholes that aren't applied to animals. I won't get into the technical details, but it makes it that much harder. It pushes the rare plants closer to the extinction boundary. And of course that doesn't help rare plants recover. So um, it can be a big problem. And one of my little side things is trying to get equal protection for plants under the law. Um, and I think it's also reflective of our society and how we value um, not only plants, but people too. 
And um, so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge and there's no question about it. Um, I work a lot in California and we do have an Endangered Species Act there too. There's some huge, huge loopholes for rare plants. Um, one of the biggest one is agriculture. Um, you can go in and disc a field of rare plants for agricultural purposes and there's no problem. There's, it's not against the state's law. And so we've seen, you know, that's a classic uh, loophole that developers use uh, to get rid of their rare plant problem. And uh, it's heartbreaking and um, there's, there uh, has not seemed to be resolution to that yet. But of course, trying to keep, keep uh, improving those laws so that they actually do protect the species that they were meant to protect. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge. The love that you have for plants just really shines through as you talk about them and the same for Max. Max, are there, with all those different species around you, are there any species in particular that you really love? Well, there sure is. Uh, I, and it's funny, if my um, environmental law professor is watching this, which sometimes, she's my mentor, so sometimes she does do a little of checking in to make sure I'm doing a good job. She knows how obsessed I am with this coastal dune um, endangered species from Hawaii. It is called the Ohai, and I think we have a slide. Um, it's this beautiful low shrubbing plant, although it can, it can get um, up to, I don't know, 10 feet tall, but I've actually never seen it be that tall in the wild. It's estimated that there's maybe only 2,000 to 3,000 of these left in the wild, um, but some of the populations are as low as 30. So it is a, it's a, it's a pretty rare plant. These beautiful silvery leaves um, is part of the, I'd say the coolest part of the plant. They um, have evolved that way with the shiny kind of golden hairs so that it reflects the sun so that the plant doesn't dry out, which means that it can grow in our coastal dunes. Um, and these pea-shaped flowers that you see, those actually don't give the smell of the plant. The plant smells like, um, I would say almost like a sweet nectarine. Although something that's really interesting about um, my favorite coastal dune plant here is that not all people can smell the ohai. So um, it's uh, in, you know, again, who knows why, but um, so as you can see on the right, there's beautiful lei, lei po'o, which is the lei on the head, and then the neck lei that, um, and this is a historical photo because unfortunately due to the rarity of these plants, this lei has now, you really, you never see it, you know? And so I think it goes back to the importance of protecting our, um, our native, our endemic, our indigenous, our rare, our endangered, our threatened plant species. Um, one reason is just because of how gorgeous our lays are from them. I mean, all of the lay in my lay pole right here is all native species, and it's harder and harder to find in lay shops um, across our state or in the way that Hawaii Tourism Authority shows, you know, our big luau's and everything. You really aren't seeing our native species. You're seeing the invasives that are being brought in. Many times invasives that are ruining our native forests, you know, like the ginger or something like that. So um, yeah, I'm a little Ohio obsessed. It's an obsession that doesn't really hurt anybody. Um, I, uh, I, I love them. They're amazing. So yes. That's really? awesome. And that's such an like iconic picture and image. And back to Southern California where Eileen lives, probably the most iconic plant where you are is the Joshua tree. Like from having a U2 album named after it to having an entire national park named after it. Um, What's going on with the Joshua tree? Yeah, yeah it's a, definitely an uh, uh, iconic uh, tree, but it's really not a tree. It's actually a giant lily, just so you know, uh, which makes it even more incredible. And um, yeah, there it is. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, you know, middle-aged, I'd say, Joshua tree out there. Uh, yeah, so Joshua tree. Um, Joshua tree is taken a hard hit from climate change in the respect that uh, people have been out monitoring them, seeing uh, you know, how many baby Joshua trees are coming online. Technically, we call that recruitment of uh, Joshua trees. And 
in the southern part of its range, uh, which includes Joshua Tree National Park, uh, there isn't any recruitment. So we're having the um, uh, nice old uh, Joshua Tree sages plant out there, but uh, there's no youngsters coming on to replace them. Uh, so there's great concerns about what is going to happen with the Joshua Tree. They are, um, we have petitioned that at the state level, um, the Western Joshua Tree, there's actual uh, genetic information that separates uh, the, what we think of commonly as Joshua trees into two uh, putative species that hasn't been published, so we can't really call them species yet, but um, certainly the um, morph of the plant or how it actually looks um, is different between the ones that you find in the western part of the Mojave and the ones that you find in the eastern part of the Mojave. And so we've petitioned the Western uh, group of Joshua trees at the state level for protections. Um, they, outside of Joshua Tree National Park, there's very few places where they are actually protected. Um, and with the effects of climate change uh, happening, it's, the modeling shows that it's very likely that uh, the Southern part of its range will, um, not be around uh, in 50 years or so uh, as the old Joshua trees die off. Um, and because it relies on a single pollinator, a single pollinator, uh, it's, it's really concerning about the, t the actual timing for pollination to even occur in some of the, in some of the southern populations now. So anyway, it's, it's uh, it's a threat for Joshua trees. We're trying to remedy that through um, getting it listed under the state. Um, we're expecting to have a decision for at least um, at the uh, state level on the 22nd of September. And it looks like it's going in a good direction for at least consideration of listing the species. And we'll know in about a year from now whether or not they actually uh, protect the species as uh, threatened. So uh, yeah, it's a great plant, very, you know, it's like the classic Dr. Seuss looking tree <laughs> and they're wonderful. So many species in the desert depend on them, especially avian species. So they're, they're fabulous. So just like Glacier National Park isn't gonna have any more glaciers, Joshua Tree National Park might not have any more Joshua trees unless we take action and help them out, which yes. we're gonna do. We're gonna take action and help them out. Yes, so we have. We <laughs> Which brings me to my next question. How can our members help save endangered plants? I mean, what do you have for us about how people can help? Well, certainly um, the action alert that you mentioned is a great opportunity. We do those, you know, occasionally we had one for the Joshua tree for sure, and we will in the future as well. Um, so look for that on our website. Um, you know, the wonderful thing about plants as well, I think, is that there are opportunities even to grow rare plants. Uh, I know that in California, you know, we definitely have them in the trade. They're not the easiest thing to grow, but certainly there's benefits to having them in your yard. And it's not like everybody that has a rare plant in their yard. So if you are um, a, a good gardener, um, that's an opportunity also. There's a lot of different ways. There's, you know, places that uh, collect seed uh, and, and basically have um, collections of species that are nearing um, extinction so that we do have those and those, that, as they call it, germplasm to, um, to uh, work with in the future. Um, there's, of course, uh, revegetation efforts like with the incredible fires that we're having here right now. I'm s sitting under a very orange sky with lots of smoke as I watch Cal Southern California burn up. There's going to be opportunities there to go back in and revegetate um, areas. Um, you know, I personally don't believe in restoration because I don't think that humans are capable of wrapping their heads around the complexity of nature, <laughs> but we can certainly help nature develop that complexity by revegetating areas. And that's happened as well. 
and then protecting them, obviously. Um, you know, relieving the threats that can be ameliorated. Um, so fencing it off like what Max suggested about uh, dealing with uh, feral livestock or not even feral livestock, re regular livestock. Um, those sorts of things can be done to help uh, keep these plants around. Max, how can people help save endangered plants in Hawaii? Well, the biggest thing, right, is just to educate yourself, get, um, get involved, get out into nature, really um, create this personal relationship with these plant species because, you know, once they become your friends, once they become your family, it's impossible to turn your back on them. And from that, then there's a myriad of ways that folks can get involved through their careers, through volunteering, through donations. And so, again, I would really love to, to um, pump the Plant Extinction Prevention Program and the amazing work that they do. Um, their budget has been cut by, I think, almost 90% um, by the feds. And then the state is in the state is, you know, especially with what's going on with the global pandemic, that um, it's unsure what the funding will be for this program. And so, again, if, if you have it in you to, to give, this is an amazing organization to give to, to ensure that there are um, these rare, endangered, and special plants for generations to come. I think also it's about um, being optimistic, right? It's about being optimistic. You know, take a leaf of faith, you know? Understand that everyone is rooting for you, rooting for us. <laughs> You know, and, um, and realize that the reason why I say, like looking at all the participants, a big mahalo to everyone. Um, but the reason why, you know, trees have so many friends is because they branch out, right? And so make sure that you, you, know, <laughs> you come on. My plants were laughing. They liked that one. So, um, but to really, to really get involved on, um, you know, on every Kind of part of the landscape as you can and um, you know it, it's heartbreaking to hear that in or to, you know to know that in our federal ESA law and our Endangered Species Act that yes that plants are second-class citizens and as uh, you know as a member of different states as, as our members are all over the continent and here in Hawaii too you know Hawaii has taken really um, productive actions to change our own state endangered species act to actually bring plants up to the same level as our animal species. And so, you know, lobby your decision makers, get into their offices or at this time, Zoom call them, you know, send letters, you know, if it's something that's important to you, people can't ignore um, the masses when it comes to this kind of, this kind of work. And then yeah, stay involved with the center. I mean, I feel privileged enough to be able to work with these incredible humans that um, I consider also my family. Um, you know, we are all joking that like, what, we, we, all, we all talk to each other and we're, we, we're all nerds on this and we love it, but you know, so just stay involved. If you're nerdy like us, get in here, get into the burrito. We, we <laughs> <have to. laughs> Max is very punny. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to some questions that you all have now. If we don't get to your question today, join us on Slack tomorrow at noon, or you can send us an email. Karina is behind the scenes fielding these questions for us. And first one is, what's the difference between state and federal protection for plants? Somebody on this webinar knows about the Lasix lupin, which has state protection, but not federal protection. They're asking about that one. Mm. So each jurisdiction, and Eileen can jump on board with this after for more um, in-depth for that one species, but each jurisdiction, each state, um, the Federal Endangered Species Act is kind of an overarching law that the states have to follow, but the states can make their own Endangered Species Act more stringent than that federal law. So that kind of is the, um, is the tension or the rub between different jurisdictions, different states, and the way that they look at species protection um, when it relates to plants so yeah and yes that's yeah that's true um, my experience as well is that federal law applies more to in plants specifically when it involves either federal lands or has some other connection to federal projects you know whether that be um, funding comes some federal funding that comes to support the project or, um, you know, a, a, there's other ways that the feds can get involved on private lands projects. But if, 
there isn't that nexus, uh, then the feds really turn their backs on the plants. And so that's where the state laws can really help. And not all states have rare plant laws uh, that protect rare plants. So I feel lucky in my work in California that we do have that as a mechanism to help uh, protect plants uh, primarily on private lands, although there's some big loopholes and there's definitely the need for improvement to protect uh, rare plants. It's better than other places. Um, so, you know, that's, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the, the difference. And, you know, some, some places like Nevada, they don't even have rare plant laws um, that are useful, really. So. Yes, yeah, state protections really vary by state. And even under the Federal Endangered Species Act, vertebrates get the most protection. And invertebrates, even the monarch butterfly, can't get protection as a distinct population segment. And neither can plants. That only applies to vertebrates. So somebody asked, and I'm going to ask you guys, do you think there's any hope for, for narrowing the lesser protection that plants get compared to animals? Yes, I agree. Yeah, I think there's, and I think there's big efforts out there. There's um, a nationwide, um, so a USA group called the Native Plant Protection Campaign that basically organizes uh, not only native plant societies, because many states have native plant societies, uh, but also um, different garden clubs, horticultural interests, those types of organizations collectively to, um, you know, lobby, basically lobby Congress to uh, increase protections for plants in, uh, at the federal level. And then of course, many of the native plant societies are very instrumental in getting protections at the state level, which has been successful both in Hawaii as well as in California uh, and, and other states as well. So I think that there's, you know, it's dedicated people that care about plants that are making it happen. And there are those uh, groups out there that definitely, you know, you should check out um, if you're not already affiliated with them and, um, you know, support those efforts because that's what it's going to take is, you know, <laughs> large masses of plant loving people coming together to make the change. What suggestions do you guys have to advocate for plants to the public for people who are like, well, what good is it anyway? Why should we save this plant? How do you get people to come around? Just having like I said, that personal connection with different species, um, just like we all like different types of food or different types of clothes or different types of animals. It's the same thing with plants, right? So maybe maybe that succulent doesn't really speak to someone, but maybe that that fern does. And so being, um, being kind with people on their journey into understanding um, the importance of plants, being loving with them, being empathetic, that maybe um, they weren't raised in a, um, like for me, I'm just so lucky to be raised where I was raised, but you know, from folks that are raised in a concrete jungle, maybe they just weren't exposed. And so just really um, helping to shepherd them into having that, that personal connection so that they can go on to really make um, big, large public change. Somebody asked about climate change and plants. Um, how can threatened species that are threatened by climate change be helped? Mm. Then it's not as easy as putting up a fence to keep the cows out. <laughs> no, it gets complicated because um, it's so species dependent. Um, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about the coastal strand species. That's a, it's a, that's a tough one because, um, you know, there's not other habitat to really, uh, help them migrate to. And there's, uh, of course, a whole um, dialogue about assisted migration. You know, animals have it easier in that they're able to move. Um, and plants really can only do that, um, you know, through seed dispersal or prop other propagule dispersal. And one of the things that we worry about with the Joshua tree, for example, is that uh, you know, they're not going to be able to move fast enough to keep up with the, the um, with climate change as it progresses. And so will there need to be facilitated uh, migration? And uh, obviously, you know, there's opinions on all sides of those things. But I think for some of these plants, yeah, we're going to have to really intervene and help them get to spots that are going to be um, 
appropriate for them to make a living. And uh, so it's, but again, it's very species specific as to what their needs are. Is it the soils? Is it the hydrological regime? You know, what are the different um, necessities for the, these plants to survive? And it's probably all of those things actually. But um, yeah, it's gonna be complex and it's gonna take um, people caring about these species to, to help them out, in my opinion. John, like for, for the Lasix lupin that we showed you earlier, the pretty pink flower, climate change is impacting it because it's drier up in its alpine habitat and so small mammals are eating its seeds, which they wouldn't have done when more things could grow up there when it wasn't so hot and dry. So scientists are actually going up there and fencing off the individual plants to protect their seeds because its habitat is protected, but climate change is threatening it anyway. So it's very species specific. Max, what were you going to say? Oh yeah, here in Hawaii, I mean, especially with climate change, um, sea level rise is one of our biggest concerns. And especially with our dry land forests and our coastal dune ecosystems that are, you know, in the direct path of that. And so what do you do um, for each of those species independently is, um, is really challenging. But I think it also comes back to being smart consumers, being smart with our choices to end our reliance on fossil fuel. You know, there's these big acts that we can that you know, we vote with our dollar. And so really being conscious of how we live our lives and um, what every little piece ends up impacting. You know? So I think, yeah, we can do it. Again, si se puede, we can do it. Si se puede. <laughs> um, somebody asked about cloning. What about cloning plants to bring up population numbers? Yeah. Certainly been used as a technique, yeah. No question about that. But a lot of times what it comes down to though is where's the habitat? And that's always my concern and why, you know, I'm a really big fan of critical habitat designations be for rare plants because uh, I, that's what I think it's all about. And you can grow as many rare plants as you want, but if the habitat isn't there for them to make a living off of and successfully reproduce themselves, then, um, you know, you're not really doing a sustainable recovery. So looking towards this ecosystem-based approach for conservation management is, I think, the biggest thing that we can do to um, ensure their survival of not this, just these rare species, but also all the other species that are dependent on them, right? And so you can't just look at conservation in a vacuum, just clone one plant, and then boom, we did it. It's really figuring out these large-scale kind of, um, you know, like, I, I, fencing is problematic in Hawaii because we have subsistence hunting and fishing, and it is a an interesting tension but I mean you look at the work that like New Zealand's done and it's really it is possible it is possible to to bounce back these incredible species. Someone asked is it useful for people to grow endangered plants or should the seed be preserved for specialists to save and use? I think so yes I mean here in Hawaii definitely I mean we've had a huge surge of um, and in California too of having native plants and rare plants being planted in your folks gardens in their homes and of course having those instead of invasive species is going to be beneficial to all the pollinators to all the insects that depend on them so yeah I say plant away if you not if you're Eileen and you don't have a green thumb and then you just can't <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so I, I would agree. I mean, I think that, you know, seed banks are useful, but, you know, it's all about, and seeds are alive, but it's, to me, it's all about, you know, the plants actually breaking that <laughs> dormancy, germinating and producing. So I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of actually outgrowing plants. And, and uh, to me, seed banks are like a sort of last resort, but I'd much rather have the the uh, actual living plant bodies out there, you know, soaking up the sun, doing their photosynthetic thing. Yeah. What about genetically modified plants? Um, of, if it's like a genetic modification to make them more resistant to disease? Mm. Well, I don't know that's, that that's been tried a lot with at least rare plants um, because, you know, they're not usually grown in a monoculture and have problems necessarily. 
I think the problems for rare plants are not in diseases necessarily. Um, and I'm sure there's some exceptions out there, but it's been my experience that it is the other pressures um, that are put on the plants uh, through habitat uh, development um, and invasives. I mean, Max, I was really glad that you talked about and touched on the invasives issue because I think that's a really, uh, that's, that's a huge threat to a lot of rare species um, is just the not being able to compete with our invading plants um, because they're at a disadvantage um, in, through uh, not by having, you know, other, by having herbivory and by having diseases that invading species aren't affected by and et cetera. So I don't know, and to get back to the question of genetically modified, um, I haven't seen that even be um, really considered uh, because there's other uh, less expensive, if you will, fixes for rare plants a lot of times. We are out of time. That went by really fast because plants are so much fast. fun. But thank you so much, Max and Eileen, and thank you at home for joining wow. us and to Karina behind the scenes for making the magic happen. Next week, we're going to talk about winning. We're going to talk about success stories and strategies because despite all the bad news this year, we've made some significant gains for plants and animals. So we're going to have a good news webinar. Then the last week of the month is a food justice film festival. So we'll, we'll send you emails about that. Remember to take the action alert that you're going to get right after this webinar, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.